Call to order the February 13th, 2024 business meeting of Simpsonville City Council. Ms. Clark, will you call the roll, please? Yes, Mayor. Council Member O'Rear. Here. Council Member Roop. Here. Council Member Williams. Here. Council Member Roche. Here. Council Member Pinkerton. Council Member Hutchings. Here. Mayor Shoemaker. Here. Please rise as you are able and join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This time I invite Mr. Phillips to the podium to deliver his audit presentation. And there is a remote there, if you're ready. And I will queue up your presentation. All right. Well, thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. I was supposed to be here last month, but I had um, some medical issues that came up, and everything's good now, though. So that's good. The remote, by the way, the big oh. button is it's up there in the upper left hand corner. The same button. Is, is it, it not on? on? It should be. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm going to put it up here. I'm no, not the microphone. The remote. Oh, control. I'm sorry. sorry. Yes, great. Um, as you know, you, uh, this is related to fiscal year 23, uh, so I know a lot of you are already in 24, and some of you are already flipped to your 25 uh, budget mindset um, as you're trying to even start that process. But again, you know, what we try to do, instead of going through the big book that was probably sent out, you know, this PDF is over 100 pages long. Um, that's pretty hard to cover in a meeting like this and to make it interesting. Um, so, you know, what we try to always do is summarize things in, in a PowerPoint. So, again, as we go through this, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to interject, or if you want to wait to the end, uh, that will be fine as well. Uh, but we'd like to remind everybody um, that uh, is, there's, is, there's such an importance to have strong internal controls, and not just at the city, uh, but pretty much at any organization. You want there to be checks and balances. Uh, you want to make sure that one person can't do it all. And so one of the things we do as your auditors is we try to kick the tires uh, in your significant internal control processes to make sure things look like they're working right. And so, for example, let's just say if I looked at your main bank account and it was never being reconciled, not only would that be important that I talk to Christine and Diana about, but it's very important that you know about that. Uh, because you can't fix it if you don't know it's not working right. Uh, so again, we're doing that, and these are your financial statements, uh, so that when we come to the next slide, you know, our responsibility as your auditors is to issue an opinion. Uh, we give you reasonable assurance, and remember, we're looking at things from a materiality level, and each person's materiality could be a little bit different. Uh, but from a professional standard standpoint, it's usually 1% to 2% of total assets or total revenue by opinion unit. So that's kind of our guide in what we're doing. And so we've issued an unmodified, and that's a strange term, uh, but that's really a clean opinion. If we modified our report, uh, we would say everything looks good but cash, or everything looks good but capital assets. Um, so we've issued an unmodified because we're not aware of anything being materially stated. All right, well, let's look uh, at the thing that probably everybody cares about a lot, uh, probably the most, is your fund balance. That chart there, I think, really shows you a little bit of trend um, and gives you a little history here. Uh, but your fund balance in fiscal year 23 increased about 700000 in the general fund. But remember, this is after transferring out $2.1 million into your capital projects fund because you have that standing policy. We're going to set aside money for future capital projects, and that took place. So, you know, make sure you see that part of that uh, slide there as well. Um, you do have a little bit of restricted fund balance uh, in your general fund. Uh, that relates to unspent bond proceeds and some court monies. Um, there's a little bit of non-spendable, so then when we come to the next slide, uh, it's a term, it's kind of a strange term for some. It's unassigned, meaning there's no constraints on it. 
And there you have about 18.9 million, um, which is about 92% of your 2023 actual expenditures uh, and about 80% of your 2024. Now, the GFOA, which is the Government Finance Officers Association, they're kind of like the Bible of governments. They recommend a minimum of two months. That's just a minimum. Um, and as you can see, you have a city policy where you want to make sure you're at least maintaining 25. So against those measurements, you're really, you have a really good fund balance there. All right, so why do you want to keep a, a solid fund balance? Well, remember, some of your revenues only come in at certain times. Your real property taxes, remember, they get levied in October. People start paying in December if they want the tax deduction. Um, and then January, February, or they start having to pay penalties. So most people are paying them within a three-month cycle there. Business licenses, a lot of those are all being paid at certain seasons. So there's your fund balance ebbs and flows throughout the year. It goes up and down a little bit uh, depending on the time of year. Um, it also helps you with significant emergencies and unanticipated expenditures. So if something bad happened, you have the ability to respond without necessarily having to borrow or come up with another option there. It gives you flexibility. So let's say you have a project and you're like, you know what, we can borrow half of it, we can pay for half of it. You have, you have flexibility there. Um, when you issue debt and they see you have a strong fund balance, they're going to give you better rates than the other entity that's up and down and all around. Um, it just helps you for planned future capital expenditure. I think one of the things that you've seen, you've got a lot of projects going, but some of that stuff came in higher than you thought. So how do you do that when all of a sudden inflationary pressures really begin to push onto some of your projects? Well, if you have some fund balance, you can say, you know, we can cover that with this. Uh, we have some excess here that we can help cover that. And it's just important in uncertain economic times. You need to have rainy day money. Um, so, again, if something bad happens or if the economy really pulls back, how long can I go before I'm in really maybe in dire straits? All right, so let's look at your um, general fund revenues. Uh, they were $23.5 million. Uh, the biggest piece, as you see there, is $17.7 million in taxes. And then you see those other areas as well. Uh, this is an increase uh, of about half a million over the prior year. And pretty much your main thing there was just a growth in your tax revenues. And uh, so remember, you, you, even though you may not have increased your millage, but your assessed values keep growing. And so that tax money is still coming in pretty strong there. Um, as it relates to budget, um, you came in 2.3 or 11% over budget. Uh, the biggest area there, again, is the tax revenues. And part of that... Uh, remember, when you're putting that budget together, you're doing that February, March, April, you're putting all of that together, you don't know how the year's going to turn out, and you're being conservative because you don't know how this year's going to turn out. And I'm not going to take what I think I got this year and assume I'm going to grow another 5%. Um, your staff is trying to play it safe because you don't want to get in a shortfall. You want to make sure you're on the good side of that equation. All right, well, let's look at your expenditures. Um, they were $20.5 million. Uh, you see the various areas. The biggest, of course, is public safety, and that's pretty typical. We find it to be usually 45 to 60 percent of most of our municipal governments, um, and you see those other departments as well. But as it relates to the prior year, it was about a $700,000 increase, um, a lot of it in public safety. Uh, but remember, what generally is going to drive your cost are payroll and benefits. And remember, you gave about a four and a half cost of living adjustment. But even though you do that, remember, sometimes you're not fully staffed. A lot of times you're not fully staffed. So you could have expected it to be higher. So when we look at the budget on the bottom, you were under budget. Well, a lot of that is because certain positions aren't full the whole year. But you have to budget them as if they are going to be there. Because what if everybody is there? You've got to make sure you at least have it available if everybody is fully staffed for the year. All right, well, let's look at some of your other funds. Uh, your accommodation and hospitality tax fund had approximately $19.6 million in fund balance. Uh, $5.1 million uh, was restricted for tourism-related uh, expenditures. That's just your normal H tax monies. But remember, you issued some debt, and a lot of that is still unspent for some of the projects that was going on. 
Um, and that was about $13.3 million. And those projects, we see them outside as we uh, drive by or, or walk along the street. And those monies will, again, start being depleted as those projects um, are, are being worked on. Um, your revenues in this fund were about $4.1 million. And your expenditures were about $3 million. And remember, a lot of those projects were still in the design, engineering, kind of the startup phases. You're going to see that money really start flowing in fiscal year 24, the year we're in right now. Uh, remember your Sensonville Municipal Facility Court Fund. Um, you have approximately $9.7 million there. And again, that's unspent bond proceeds for these projects as well. All right. Um, remember, uh, we had to set up in years past an American Rescue uh, Plan Fund. That's the ARPA money. Um, and so, again, you have uh, received it, but you don't recognize it as revenue until you incur eligible expenditure. So right now, um, when I say right now, it's June 30th of 23, uh, you had $11.6 million of grant money being deferred that are going to be used going forward for these eligible costs and expenditures, most of it being with the capital projects. Um, your capital projects fund, remember that was set up a few years ago, and y'all have systematically, as you've had good years, you've been putting money aside and saving uh, for projects in the future. Um, you have approximately $5.2 million in fund balance there. Um, remember, we transferred that 75% uh, this year, which was about $2.1 million. All right, well, let's look at your sewer fund. Um, you had approximately $20.7 million in that position. Uh, a $4.3 million was unrestricted, um, and a slight increase in it, it grew this past year by about $900,000. Uh, we list some of the revenues, some of the expenditures there. Uh, remember, also, if people or developments give you their infrastructure, that's a donated revenue to you, and so we reflected about half a million of donated capital assets or infrastructure uh, related to this fund. Um, then lastly here, the Public Works Fund has about $2.3 in net position at the end of the year. Um, it had a slight decrease, um, but you had revenues of about $1.5 and transfers out of about $1.7. All right, well, just wanted to remind you about uh, the pension obligation. Remember, you participate in the state uh, retirement plan, your, your employees. Uh, and the GASB back in uh, you know, the early 2000s, it became applicable in 2015, started saying if you participate in state cost-sharing plans, every participating government uh, on the government-wide statements needs to record their proportionate piece of that asset or liability on your books. And unfortunately, the state plan is pretty big liability. Um, and so we calculate that liability by taking your pension contributions that you pay into the PIVA as a percentage of all contributions paid into the PIVA for that plan. And whatever that percentage is, you get that percentage of the state liability. And it's a pretty big number. Um, so the liability, unfortunately, has gone up. Um, from 15.1 to 18.1, but remember, they're not going to ask you to write a check uh, for 18.1 million. But the way that they get you is the second to last bullet point there is the rates are going up, and that remember that rate that you see there is a rate against your payroll. So for every you know dollar of payroll, you're paying 18.56 to the SCRS. And for those that are in the PRS, you're going to pay 21.24. And remember, your employees also pay another 9.75. 9 so there's like 30 cents on every dollar that's going into these state pension plans trying to shore it up so that their hope is uh, as they, keep, they raise these rates that the liability will go down on the state level and get better funded than your liability. Uh, but we have to get to a funding level of about 85%, and it's about at 56% funded. So it's still about a good ways to go uh, before I can see those rates coming down. All right. Other items just to kind of make you aware of, you remember your capital assets or your property, plant, and equipment, they increase 6.1. You're going to see that number go way up in fiscal year 24. But in fiscal year 23, you had additions. 
of $9.9 million. We kind of list some of those projects for you to see there. Uh, remember, you had started on the municipal complex, the park project. You still had a good bit of sewer rehab going. The streetscape was just starting, a lot of the engineering and so forth, and some on the art center. Um, then we list some of the building uh, and improvement additions. And then you had a little bit of road infrastructure and some utility donations that we talked about on the sewer slide. And so that gives you a little bit of flavor of what some of those resources were being used for uh, during fiscal year 23. And then remember, when we capitalize something, let's say it's a, a fire truck, it's a million dollars, and let's say we gave it a 10-year life, we begin to depreciate every one of those assets over their estimated uh, lives. And so the depreciation on all your assets was about $3.8 million. All right, <clears throat> long-term obligation was kind of quiet this year. Remember, in prior years, you'd issued a number of debt issuances. So pretty much what you were doing this year was just making your regularly scheduled principal payments. Um, <clears throat> you had a legal debt limit of about uh, $10.3 million and only about $300,000 of outstanding debt towards that limit. Remember, that limit is something that you as council um, could issue bonds without having to do a referendum. Um, if you go over a certain amount, you've got to take it uh, to your constituents. Uh, so you have the capacity to issue debt up to $10 million approximately on your debt. That number changes every day. Um, so you, know, you would have to always get that uh, reconfirmed. Uh, your debt service payments for the year that we're in right now is like your mortgage payment. It's about $2.9 million. All right, so we didn't have really any big auditing changes that we see coming, uh, but we do have one change next year um, as it relates to capital assets. Um, in the old days, the golden rule was is that as long as you had a capitalization threshold and about every government or entity uses $5,000. So if something costs more than $5,000, we capitalize it, we depreciate it. Well, the GASB started saying, well, what if you bought 1,000 computers at $1,000? Now, those individually would not be capitalized under the old methodology. They're like, well, you know, that's pretty significant. We want you to capitalize them going forward. And so now what they're saying is if you buy a group of related items and they're significant, you need to capitalize them. So your staff um, will be looking at that. Now, you would think, well, that's not a big deal. That's going forward. But the Gatsby said, you know what? We want you to look at it retroactively. We want you to go back over your prior years and look at what you purchased. If you bought a lot of the little things, and they are significant, we want you to capitalize them. So, again, that would be something that will take place next year and just kind of be aware of that. Um, we did have one item that we did note. One of the things that we do as your auditors, you know, we're auditing, we're checking things. We're just trying to make sure things get in the right year. And you had a lot of construction projects going on. We saw a couple payments that got paid late, but they related to the prior year. Costs had been incurred. So how we're doing is they're getting paid right. We're just moving them to the right year. So if we have something significant like that, we just have to make you aware of it so that the numbers are in the appropriate bucket between the two years. Uh, we did not have to do a single audit this year, but remember those ARPA funds, those are federal monies. We're probably going to have to do a lot of single audits for several years in the future. So just kind of be aware of that. That's coming. Um, and that adds extra pages to the report. And what that requires from your auditors is we have to look at that ARPA grant and make sure you're complying with the federal standards on how you're spending that money. That's always, there's always strings attached to significant money, and that's kind of what's happening here. Um, management letter, uh, that is a separate letter that was probably distributed to you. If your staff was difficult to deal with, if they did want to book an adjustment that we thought needed to be booked, we need to make you aware of that. Uh, we had none of those issues. They really are uh, great to work with. Uh, so summary, um, you know, just remember unmodified, that's a good term. I know it's weird. Um, I really feel like you've got strong financial con condition here. And really the staff are really, really good to work with. Um, a lot of our staff want to be on this job, and plus it's close. <laughs> Any questions? I know I kind of go quick on this, but most people like that. Council Member Yes, yeah, sir. Going back to um, just the future auditing, um, it perked my ears because we're going to be buying a great deal of furniture 
chairs, computers, probably computers. Um, what does that word significant mean? What is a dollar value? And does that, that bad timing for us as a city, or is this going to affect us negatively having done this rather than doing this? The good thing year? on your fund level, outside of the enterprise fund, you don't ever record capital assets. So it's just those government-wide statements where we record the pension liabilities, all your debt, your capital. That's the one that has the biggest impact. But what most of our entities are doing is they're going to come up with a group purchase threshold. Maybe that number is $25,000. So if you ever buy a group of items and it exceeds more than $25,000, I just automatically count. So then I don't have to worry because that's a reasonable, let's just say, limit. Um, you don't want to have to every time, well, is this one significant or not? You know, and we will work with them on hopefully coming up with a reasonable group purchase threshold to make it easy to employ or use going forward. Okay, thank you. One, one last question. Yes. The sewer, I think I had a question on this. The sewer fund, the, uh, perhaps the administrator or Grayson could help me with this, the um, 500000 that have, have been donated from that infrastructure, can you, what do you know what that was? It was like was. the development, I just don't remember <coughs> specifically which development. Typically that's infrastructure that we take ownership of after a development's complete. Okay. So in a new subdivision, for instance, the sidewalks, the roads, the, well in this case sewer, the sewer lines that are part of, they become part of our collection system. And so we're responsible for the maintenance, maintenance of them. It seems a little odd to count it as an asset because, you know, it is, but then it isn't because eventually we're going to be spending money to maintain it. Okay. Thank you. And these developers wouldn't usually want to build all that unless they had somebody to give it all to. They don't want to be stuck with it forever. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Phillips. I also can speak for council. Thank you for not giving us a hundred page deck uh, that you, uh, <laughs> you, gave, you gave us what we needed in a, in a very effective way. So we appreciate your work working with the city. Any other member of council with a question or comment? Okay, I have one, and I think we may end up needing count, uh, Administrator Graceley's help with this one. When you were talking about our healthy fund balance, I think you implied, or at least I inferred, that you were saying a big reason for our healthy fund balance was because of the increased uh, uh, assessment values of properties in the city. But because of the rollback provisions in state law, we're not really able to pick up uh, a windfall like that. And, my, and, and I think if you can help me make sure I'm getting this correct, the reason we're seeing an increase in, in revenues is a lot from growth, uh, the things that are coming into the city, any new construction that comes with that growth, and any actual home improvement or addition to a home that will, you know, increase the, the you know, legitimately increase the assessed value rather than having a windfall just because home prices are generally going up. Do I have that correct? You do. When the county does reassessment, we're required to most times we roll back millage so that there's not a windfall of revenue. Right. Because so, if we did, then people would be paying more taxes, and we try to keep them, you know, based on the reassessment that happens um, around the same level of tax burden. And, you know, we don't collect. If we were able to keep the same millage every time there's a reassessment, then we would have a much higher fund balance. But state law prevents us from doing that, rightfully so. I just I wanted to make sure that that was clear, that we didn't yeah, have good point. the public thinking that, oh, gee, you know. When was the last reassessment? Uh, two years ago. That's what I was thinking, yeah. two years ago. Yeah. Right. So so we do have to roll back that millage. And that's every and five years, right? Yes. yes. At the same time, I think it also needs to be abundantly clear that we are enjoying increased revenues because of our growth, which has allowed us to increase our budget and keep up with the needs of the city as we've grown and um, be able to have an, an increasing revenue year on year on year. But that does not keep going that way if we don't keep growing. Um, so that uh, the only reason I make the point is we have gone years without raising our millage 
because we have enjoyed this phenomenal growth. And I just want to make sure that we um, don't walk around with this idea that that lasts forever. So, yeah. In fact, we decreased millage the last time after reassessment. Right. We did drop the millage. Um, and one point I do want to make, since we're on the subject of um, fund balance, is that you know a lot of that is being spent on the projects that are ongoing. And so don't expect uh, next year when, when David's up here giving this report to have that $19 million fund balance right. because it's likely not going to be there. We're going to spend it. Right. We're spending it, and that's what we should be doing. I mean, we definitely – I like to stay around 40% fund balance. I know we're required to stay at 25%, but I think 40 is a much more comfortable number. So that's the goal that um, Director Farino and I have in mind when we're allocating resources to these special projects. You know, we don't want to get carried away with spending too much of the fund balance because we do need to have a rainy day fund because you never know. Thank you, Councilor Barber. Yeah, to me, just a basic question, I guess, looking at the general fund revenues, uh, what would be, and I know this probably can't be an exact number, in the taxes, 17.7 million, what percentage split is between business and residential? Um, there is a, a, a table, is there? in table six of the report, and it shows you all your assessed values, so that's like on page 110. So if I look there, residential is about 54 million, and commercial was about 60 million. But then there's personal property, so there's other kind of categories too. Yeah. And one thing I would just say, in the statistic tables in the back, it shows you your millage over the last 10 years. It shows you your assessed values over the last 10 years. It's some pretty good data. And it would help, you know, like the mayor was talking about, it really would show you a kind of a picture of how the assessed values of millage have changed um, over the last 10 years. Can, um, is this report going to be on the city website for citizens to see? And yes, and we wait until council has the report and then it goes on there. We also put um, the annual budget on there. We publish check registers every month. We try to be very transparent with our finances. Th this in particular, the, the, big, the big one, would they, would they have access to that? Okay, thank you. Council? Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Each member of council has received a copy of the minutes from our January 9th, 2024 business meeting. Are there any changes to the minutes? Hearing none, the minutes will stand approved as written. We had no one sign up this evening for citizen comments, so we will move on to our next item. Business item 7A, Greenville County Intergovernmental Agreement, MPDES Co-Permittee. Administrator Gracely, will you summarize, please? Yes, this will be much briefer than the presentation you received at Committee of the Whole last month. So, um, essentially, this is to keep us in compliance with our MPDES permit, for which we are a co-permittee with Greenville County, and to clearly define our roles, our responsibilities versus the county's responsibilities, um, the county attorney drafted an intergovernmental agreement. So rather than a memorandum of understanding, we are now using an intergovernmental agreement, which is much more detailed than what we were using before. Nothing has changed. It's the same process we've always used. Um, it's just clearly defining it in this document. Thank you. Motion is in order. Councilmember Hutchings. Mayor Council, I make a motion to approve the Greenville County Intergovernmental Agreement NPDES co permit Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Hutchings with a second from Councilmember Roche. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 All opposed signify by saying no. Motion carries by a vote of six to zero. Seven B, first reading of ordinance O-2024-01, ordinance to amend sections 2-65 of Division 2 of Article 2 of Chapter 2 of the Simpsonville, City of Simpsonville Code of Ordinances. 
And this item is one that I have put on the agenda, and uh, we discussed this at the committee, of, the last committee of the whole. And uh, the, the point of this item is to allow for greater flexibility in how we designate where, what day, what time council meetings will, will be. It has been formally listed in our code of ordinances in the past. But in order to change that and in order to be more flexible, we'd like to take that that specified date and time and place out of the actual ordinance because in order to change it, we would have to change the ordinance, which requires coming before Committee of the Whole and first and second reading. This will allow us to have a little more flexibility. So with that explanation, uh, and since it's my item, I will move that Council approve item 7B, first reading of Ordinance 0-2024-01, Ordinance to amend sections 2-65 of Division 2 of Article 2 of Chapter 2 of the City of Simpsonville Code of Ordinances. Second. I have a motion from Mayor Shoemaker and a second from Council Member Root. Discussion? Council Member Owen? Um, I spoke at the last meeting about about the verbiage in the ordinance. Um, I know Council Member O'Shea spoke of a different component of it, and I'll speak of both of them. First component, uh, I know I, I think you did adjust it in the last meeting under C, the mayor or council. Uh, I think, you know, I, I'm not sure from the legal standpoint here, but I think, you know, you're part of the council, and to, to break out a single individual uh, to make a decision Council should make, I don't think, is appropriate. Uh, and, and my point from last time was the four other, four other compelling reasons. That's awfully broad and ambiguous. Um, and I think Council Member O'Shea pointed out last time we're not we're not saying you would do anything like this, but it, it opens up for future mayors, councils, whatnot to come up with. You know, my kid's got a Boy Scout meeting I got to get to, so let's change this one to five. And then the next one, I think, I just think we, you know, this could open up for a lot of ping-ponging around times. Um, and I think we owe it to the citizens of Simpsonville to be as consistent as possible with the time, whether it be 6, 6.30, whatever. I just think we, we owe it to them uh, to be very consistent. And if they want to be regular participants in meetings, they'll know. So that's my thing. So I, I'm going to uh, uh, address that. Um, it, one thing that I want to point out is, is that if we if we make it a decision of council, then in order to change a meeting, we would have to have a formal meeting with 24 hours of notice and you know of public notice before we could call council together to change the time or place of a meeting. So we cannot do anything as a council that is not done in public with the 24 hours of notice under the Freedom of Information Act. So in order that it's, it's not so much putting it in one person's hands as giving us the ability to be nimble if we have a weather event, a, a, uh, a need to change the place of the meeting because um, you know, a water pipe burst here at City Hall, uh, that kind of thing. Not, uh, you know, I don't, I'm hopeful that not any mayor would change a meeting because of, of a Boy Scout meeting, but uh, the, that's the reason why um, uh, I listed it as the mayor. I would be open, and to, open to an amendment that we would make it a joint decision between, say, the mayor and the mayor pro tem. So that if you're, if you're concerned about it being a, a single person's decision, as long as we keep it less than a quorum of council, we can have that, that ability to be nimble um, so that, that we wouldn't have it you know, we wouldn't have to call a special meeting in order to, to say, postpone a meeting or change the location or change the time on the fly. But when you, you never can do it on the fly because even if you change it, whatever you change it to, to, you still have to give the public and council 24 hours notice. That's state law. So we can't get out of that one. So, um, Councilman Roche? Um, along with all the reasons I stated last time, as well as what Mr. Arrear has restated. Um, I'm also, uh, the new verbiage here where you've lined out and um, underlined some things, ambiguity can come from not enough specification. Ambiguity can come from too much specification. So in C, I'm thinking we can clean that up. Um, 
in a big way, um, since it says um, particularly when a particularly when a regular meeting falls on a legal holiday, if weather or other conditions make it hazardous for council members and the public to attend a meeting, or for other compelling reasons, that's a little ambiguous. Um, provided that the city council meets regularly at least once a month, or with all of that, um, I think can be polished up. And I, I think our city attorney would be <coughs> best to actually word these. I'm not against the change. I'm against uh, right now. Um, I can't approve the wording that's being presented. I will say um, I read Fountain Inn's. Um, I don't want to read all of another city's um, particular, but I did make a note to self. Um, that is a really good model. If anyone else, um, you know, cares to look that up for C and D, um, it's very concise. Not a lot of, you know, different reasons given with commas in between. It's very concise, and um, it gives the authority to the council as a whole for um, these decisions. And I, I lean more toward that. Again, I don't think for a minute that you, as mayor, are going to pull any sort of shenanigans or try to keep people from meetings. <coughs> um, but I've lived through city politics long enough to know that before you were here, um, those kind of things would have been weaponized and used. Um, that said, I think overall, we need if we're going to change this, we need to do it with transparency and accountability to the public that elected us first and foremost. I don't want to change the ordinance to be self-serving. I want to change it. If we're going to change it, it still needs to be a very predictable, consistent, we meet here, and this is when we meet. And the only reason we would change it would be here, and we would announce it here. Um, I just think that's super important that that we change the ordinance with the public in mind and not, not be self-serving. I have to say, I mean, as it is, I, I, I can't approve it, but um, if the wording to be, were to be changed to be less ambiguous and still give us flexibility, I would be for that. And like I said, I think the city attorney would be for as he has been in the past. Okay, so let me, let me clarify something here. This was written by the city attorney. The, the ordinance has proposed the parts that are not underlined come from the existing ordinance. So those, if it's not underlined, the wording hasn't been changed. If it's struck out, that is existing wording that has been struck. The, the wording that is underlined is the new wording that he added uh, as, a, as the proposed ordinance. Councilor Britt, I just have a, a, a question. Perhaps, Mr. Mayor, you can answer Administrator Bracely, if that were to happen under the, our current ordinance, if you called us an hour before a council meeting and you said we have a flood, we have no electricity, and we can't have our meeting tonight at our scheduled meeting place, we obviously don't have 24 hours to let the public know. We can't cancel without public notice. We can't just cancel council meetings. What would be our options? As of now, um, with our current ordinance, that what, what would be our only choice that we could do under that circumstance? Well, in an instance like that, if we can't physically come to the building because there's a safety or health issue, you know, say everybody on staff had the flu and we're not physically here to provide answers and direction for council, um, I think we would post a note on the door that the meeting had to be canceled for whatever reason. And then we would have to also, more than 24 hours, publish another meeting notice at a different place or time. Um, you know, this initially began because we wanted to change the meeting time from 6.30 to 6 o'clock. Right. Um, so I, I don't know how you all feel about this. Obviously, my position answers to council. I mean, if you would rather, if, Ms. Roche, if you'd feel more comfortable with that being in the hands of the administrator, and I'm not saying myself because there will be somebody else in this seat at some point because this person answers to council as a whole, maybe you'd feel more comfortable with that. Um, and then we could handle it, you know, and it would have to be a compelling reason because we would never want to 
under my counsel's wishes, anyone sitting in this seat would not want to do that. So I don't know if I could offer that as a, a compromise, maybe. Um, or as the mayor said, if you want it to be the mayor, mayor pro tem in agreement so that, you know, they have to hash it out um, before anything can be changed. But um, right now, I mean, if we had something like that and we physically could not be here for a reason, we would just have to cancel the meeting and then we would have to find a designated time and place and post that with notice before so, we could So this convene. proposed ordinance would give us the ability to It's still, maybe would, because we still, we would still have to do that, something. yes. So, and what we do every year um, is in January, um, Ms. Clark, as the city clerk, posts the meeting dates and times. Right. And so those are set at the beginning of the year, and we, to my knowledge, have never deviated from that for any reason. Mm -hmm. um, you know, compelling would mean something like, you know, we can't form a quorum because all of you have an illness. You know, we've seen that this season particularly. There's been a lot yeah. of flu going around. And, you know, if, if we're notified or our, our clerk is notified that four of you can't be here and we know there's not going to be a quorum, we can't have a meeting. And we would want to make that notice available to the public via Discover Bill, the website, to keep people from having to come out unnecessarily. Right. So that would be a compelling reason. Um, Here's another example that hasn't been mentioned, but we're moving to a new city hall. We think that's October, but regardless of when it is, we need some flexibility to change the location later this year to the new city hall from yeah. this location to that location. So I don't see a lot of changes being made. I think that it would just be, you know, the time of the meeting to six o'clock. And then in the instance, if we know we're going to have 200 people, you know, there's a controversial issue and we expect more than the capacity of this chamber or the new council chamber to hold and we needed to move it to the art center, to the auditorium where we have a much higher capacity, it gives us the flexibility to do that too. And let me just remind council, if we do pass this, which I do, I am going to support it. I think it gives us a little bit of flexibility. I know our minds always worried about future councils. Are they going to take advantage of things that we're passing? Well, let's remind ourselves that if, if there's a future mayor that the council thinks is going to be authoritative on this, it's going to take the majority of council to rechange what we are putting in into policy. So I'll just um, leave it at that. Thank you. I can come back to the point that you were making about if we had some catastrophic thing that prevented us from meeting in this building, you cannot call meeting of council. I can. It is already on our ordinances that the mayor can call a special meeting. That's paragraph D in the current ordinance. I don't think any past mayor, whatever problem mayors we have had, has abused that privilege. And so I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that um, I believe this is a lot of power in the mayor's hands. It's something that's necessary to do that uh, paragraph D also says the majority of council can call a meeting. Well, the majority of council can't do anything without giving public notice having a meeting. and having a meeting. So you can't even call the meeting to have the, the, the discussion about when to have the meeting. The council can't do that because you would have done that outside of the, the Freedom of Information Act. So that's why you need this flexibility in one person, two people, me and the mayor pro tem, or even three people, mayor, mayor pro tem, and, and the city administrator. I just, I think we, I think we should. Uh, put that flexibility in place. Council? Council Member Hushings. Um, <clears throat> so, let me make sure I understand this. Under current uh, ordinance, if, if that scenario that uh, Council Member Rip described happened, then the mayor is calling us, the changes would be called by the mayor now, right? Right, special meeting. Um, where, where is that in here? It's not in that ordinance. Uh, ordinance 2 65, paragraph D. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the other thing um, is, does state law require anything other than that we have?
have one meeting per month, is that correct? No, one meeting per month at a time and day specified by city council. And the Tuesday meeting date is just a generally accepted date for the meeting? It's what was put in the ordinance. I'm not even sure how many years ago. I didn't look at the original ordinance to see when that was codified, but um, yes, yeah, so, you know, it can be changed again by council if, if you wanted to change, just change the meeting time and leave it at that, but I think the mayor's goal when we were looking at an ordinance change was to go ahead and cover any instance that could create difficulty in getting a meeting change because of an extenuating circumstance like illness or, you know, the building not being healthy to go into if there's a water main break or something. We can't have a meeting if we don't have functioning plumbing, so. So, uh, where, what differences is there in Paragraph C, I guess it is, and paragraph D, which is the special meeting clause. Uh, now, uh, that says emergency meetings or special meetings uh, are specified under SC. Uh, what what would this add that we don't have now with the current wording? Well, I think it doesn't really change D, as the mayor pointed out. You know, he's the only one. Either the mayor or the majority of council can call a special meeting. Otherwise, you have to have meetings at the regular meeting times that are announced at the beginning of the year and agreed upon. Um, so it doesn't change D. It would just change C to give a little flexibility for things that could come up during the course of, you know, if we've got a meeting scheduled on a Tuesday and Monday comes around and we've got an issue with the building or everybody's sick, you know, we would know that probably needs to be delayed by, you know, a couple of days. We need at least 24 hours to give proper public notice, but it's really just so that we don't have to come back to council every time. So if we decide later on, you know, we want to move the meeting to, you know, five o'clock, I don't think that's going to happen because we definitely want to give the public time to get off work and get here so they can attend. There are municipalities that have their meetings in the middle of the day. I don't think that's ever a good idea, and I don't think this body would ever approve that. Um, and if, you know, if something like that were happening with a future mayor, council could then take action to specify the time and, and limit that flexibility. You know, it could go back to the previous. It only takes, you know, committee of the whole and two readings of the ordinance to change it back. So I think if in the future you see abuses or you're concerned about that, then the majority of council can fix it. What I'm concerned about is uh, in regular meetings is that, uh, and I don't, you know, I see this, this happening under the current situation, but uh, changing that date frequently would, uh, it creates a lot more work for us. So we're certainly not going to want to do that. It would undermine the trust. A bit. And it would undermine the trust, yes. So I think that that would be used only in exigent circumstances. Or, you know, something as simple as we know there's a big crowd. Maybe we don't know until we get there and council chambers is overflowing. And we say, we're going to have to move because we want to give everybody an opportunity to be in the room and hear what's happening. Um, then, you know, we don't have to cancel the meeting and say come back in 24 hours to the other location we could you know just move on the fly if we needed to well, I'm, I'm in favor of the specifics being taken out of this ordinance as to time and date, or date. Um, but um, I'm still having trouble uh, understanding the difference between wording in this uh, section C and the to get section D special meetings. Anybody give me a scenario where that would be? C are regular meetings, D are called special meetings. Would, would not a meeting for storm related reasons what become a, an emergency meeting? Well, I mean, I suppose it probably could, yeah. But I think the idea is, you know, if it's not a storm related issue, then. I don't really know how to answer that question. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe it could just, you know, we establish a time and then 
if if there's a storm related issue or you know significant health issue then we would just have to cancel the meeting and then call a special meeting in its place i guess we could do that Councilman Roger. well i guess one more thing I, I mean the city's been here a long time and and we're just now feeling like we need to put the or other compelling reasons into this um you know, everything listed here could be weather or other conditions that could make it hazardous to be here. That, that could be sewer pipes busting. Any, that could cover a lot of stuff. Um, I, just, I just don't think it's necessary to throw the ambiguity in there because um, I think legal holidays or self-explanatory weather or other hazardous conditions, I think that covers most anything that, that's going to have a you know, true, true reason to do that. Um, and like I said, and, and like we've stated, you know, the biggest thing was really just to get this changed to six. And I, I'm not opposed to the you know, mayor, mayor pro tem approach. Uh, I'm not opposed to that part. I just, I still don't like the other compelling reasons part. It's just too ambiguous. And so I think one of the reasons why it was other compelling reasons was, for instance, in December when we were having the outgoing council members and we wanted to have a meal together as they were you know, leaving their post. Um, we couldn't have moved it to the activity center under the current ordinance because nobody had the flexibility to do that. Unless we canceled the regular meeting and called a special meeting to do it, which is more confusing, I think. Than so I don't know if we want to try to be a little more specific in the language about I guess what I'm saying is, you know, some small have been here since, what, 1901, and we're just now arguing about putting other compelling reasons in here. It seems like we've made it of 100 years without it in there, and nothing's come up to where this has been an issue. So well, we've made it during my term, my tenure here, where we've never, yeah. other than COVID, and that was under an emergency ordinance, yeah. um, we've never deviated from the schedule. Like I said, I'll, I'll go with the, the, the change the mayor stated about mayor, mayor pro tem. Uh, at least it gives two, two, two voices in there for the compelling reasons we've got uh, you know, 123 years without it. I think we can make it some So I, I do want to just reiterate what, what uh, Administrator Grisley was saying is the, the only reason for putting the other compelling reasons and compelling was just a, a word choice, uh, exigent circumstances, or I, I know that's not even a good word, but was because for the December meeting, there was a, a, a thought of changing the venue from council chambers here to the congregate dining facility, the new congregate dining facility in the activity center. And under the current ordinance, can't make that change uh, without changing the ordinance uh, would, would be what it would boil down to. So we can't change the venue uh, without actually going through this whole ordinance change. If, even if we had a compelling reason why we wanted to change the venue, uh, that was not an emergency. That wouldn't have been an emergency. And the, the, the thought process, the only reason that, that we didn't try and proceed forward with, and bump our head on that ordinance was because it became clear that we were going to have that, that uh, Mary Dale item on the agenda and we're, we're pretty confident that we were going to have full council chambers and it would not have worked well to, to change the venue. But if we had changed the venue, we would have been in violation of the ordinance. So that's, that's the reason for putting that in there. And if you're concerned about um, uh, being in the hands of just the mayor, I, I think making it a joint decision by something less than a quorum of council, either mayor and Two council members or mayor, council member, city administrator come to an agreement. If you have three people who have to agree on it, you can pretty much bet that we're not going to be changing it for no, I was good reasons. To, to, would that I was good with the two? Would that be um, a, an okay change? Yeah, mayor, mayor, pro tem. That's, that's fine with me. Um, I, don't, I don't know about moving a venue for a, that would be a compelling reason for the last meeting last year, but uh, but I, I'm good with the mayor, mayor, pro tem. Well, just to explain about the thing in December, we didn't really think there was going to be anything on the agenda other than saying goodbye to outgoing council members. Uh, so we were, we were planning to have a dinner for the outgoing council members and 
and thought there wouldn't be anything else other but you know, any other real business. And then it turned out there was real business. It wasn't a good idea to change the venue. So, Casper Rocher. So um, I see that the line, the, the line, the part that's been drawn through the structure is at 6.30 p.m. in the council chambers of City Hall. Um, I'm concerned about striking that. I think City Hall is the appropriate place to meet. Um, and I think a designated time has worked for us thus far. The public can count on it. Um, so what would that be replaced with if there's nothing there? Would that mean that council has to go and vote on what time we want to meet now? Um, I would think that if you want to replace it, if you want to change the time, the place, the date on an ongoing basis, we can take a resolution of council under this proposed wording. So we wouldn't have a designated time and place in the ordinance? Right. But I don't believe anybody is going to the ordinance to see what time we meet. They're going to the city calendar, you know, that kind of thing. Further discussion? Councilmember Hutchings? I'll follow up on what Councilman uh, Rochette is saying. If uh, regular meetings uh, shall generally be held on the second Tuesday, which is a specified day uh, of each month, and then we strike in Council Chambers, what's the reasoning behind that? I mean, would not most of our regular meetings generally be held in Council Chambers. That's what we're saying. Well, I mean, did, did, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just saying I don't see the need to strike that part. Uh, wording on that. If we, you know, if we're things generally held, then it would be an exception over to someone else. Would so would you want the language to read, generally held the second Tuesday of each month at 6 p.m. in city council chambers, unless agreed upon by, and the word generally in there, of course, unless a change is agreed upon by the mayor and the mayor pro tem in advance of the meeting? Uh, do we need to put a time in this form? I mean, it's well, we, it's, we it's structural in this version I'm looking at. I think if the word generally is in there and there's an opportunity to make a change, um, then we're okay specifying a time. But I think the problem was the current ordinance didn't give any flexibility on the time. Yeah, why not? Because this all started with just the discussion about backing the meeting up half an hour. So when we have long agendas, we're not here until we've been here until 11 o'clock at night before. So. It would just, you know, if we start half an hour earlier, then we're going to end half an hour early, was the thought process. And then, you know, that's when it came to our attention that there's no flexibility to do that unless you change the ordinance. And so we were trying to um, make it more general in the way it reads so that if there is, ever is a time that, you know, we want to change the time. You know, maybe back it up to 5.30, I don't know. I mean, I would not suggest that. I think 6 o'clock is the perfect time, but. I, I would be in favor of removing the, the 6.30 time from the, from the current ordinance, but not putting a time um, and, have, and, and have a time established by a resolution of the council, which could be, could hold until we have another resolution. Um, and then the, the wording section uh, would allow the flexibility time and place if necessary. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. I'm okay with that version. So I want to be, we're going to have to do a, a motion to amend the ordinance, uh, the proposed ordinance, but be clear on what wording it is you want to change in paragraph B. Regular meetings of council shall generally be held on the second Tuesday of each month at such time and place designated by council. Did you want to change that to to, to what, Councilman Hutchings? Um, I'm 
you're saying I don't know I don't know why we're striking Council Chambers and City Hall at the time. It's, it's, instead of the wording at such time and place designated by council, why it doesn't read that he's uh, um, as at on in the council chambers of City Hall instead. Did you leave the time out? But but so in, so regular meetings of the council shall generally be held on the second Tuesday of each month. In the council chambers of City Hall. In the council chambers at such time as designated by council in council chambers of City Hall. Right. And committee of the whole meeting shall be only held on the fourth Tuesday of each month at such time designated by council in the council chambers of City Hall. Right. Okay. So take that as a motion. Council Member Hutchings moves that the wording of the proposed ordinance be changed to the regular meetings of the council shall generally be held on the second Tuesday of each month at such time as designated by council in the council chambers of City Hall and committee of the whole meeting shall generally be held on the fourth Tuesday of each month at such time as designated by council in the council chambers of City Hall except for the months of November and December. That's the motion. Do I hear a second? That's the root point of order. While we're doing this, should we add the verbiage on the mayor pro tem before we can get it all done? We'll do that as a separate motion. It'll be a separate motion? Yes. We'll try to speed this along. So we okay. It won't take but a minute. All right. Well, I'll Good. second the motion. Okay. So is there discussion on the amendment? All in favor of amending the wording as proposed, signify by saying yes. 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 All opposed, signify by saying no. Motion carries by a vote of six to zero. Now, uh, I will move that paragraph C be amended to say the mayor and the, by joint decision of the mayor and mayor pro tem or by council or council. Um, let, me, let me try again. By joint decision of the mayor and mayor pro tem or the council may alter the schedule and location of meetings pursuant to public notice required by South Carolina Freedom of Information Act, et cetera. I'll hear a second. Second. I have a motion from the mayor to make a change to the wording of paragraph C with a second from council member Root. All those in favor signify, oh, I'm sorry, discussion? Council member Roche. I'm super redundant because the mayor, the mayor pro tem and council are all part of the council. So if we were going to do that, we could just say by council agreement or the council may alter the schedule. But then you have to have a full meeting of council with 24 hours of notice. That's the point of having it be mayor and mayor pro tem. You can do it without having to call a, a council meeting. Okay, so it would be mayor and mayor pro tem comma or council. Or what should it say, or, or a quorum of council. I'm going to withdraw my motion if there is no objection and reword the council here's the here's my proposed motion I move to change the wording of paragraph C to say the council comma or the mayor and mayor pro tem by joint decision may alter the schedule and location of meetings etc that's my motion and I have a second so the motion from the mayor and a second from council member root for clerk now, discussion? That's my brochet. So, would the, for other compelling reasons, be omitted and we just keep what we had? Uh, I didn't change the wording on compelling reasons. I felt like okay. compelling reasons could be something that we would agree upon. And that would, and by having the mayor and the mayor pro tem have to get together, you prevent people yanking the schedule around, which we don't want to see happen. Further discussion? On the motion to amend the wording of paragraph C of the proposed ordinance change, all those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 All opposed signify by saying no. All right, that motion carries by a vote of six to zero. So on the main motion to approve the first reading of ordinance zero, I'm sorry, O-2024-01, Ordinance to amend the sections 2 65 of Division 2 of Article 2 of Chapter 2 of the City of Simpsonville Code of Ordinances as amended. That's our now our revised motion. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
right, discussion? All right, so we have a motion uh, from the mayor with a second from council member Root. With no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. That motion carries by a vote of six to zero. And that concludes all of our business for this evening. If there are no objections, we will stand adjourned.